All right, for our final speaker, we have Cecilia Mbe, who is a principal research scientist at the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Cecilia will be, will be discussing caller surveillance and modeling. Thank you. So good evening, everybody, and I'm happy to be here today and to speak to you and to give you the last presentation. Uh, it's always a challenge when you have to be the last speaker of the day and people are already tired. But I'm here to share with you part of the uh, data that we have from our project, which is a collaborative project with the Emory University. And I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity because I've been able to meet some of our collaborators here from Emory University, who we had not had a chance of meeting because most of our meetings were, were virtual. And today I thank you for that. So, and the other collaborator is also from Ohio State University. And the talk today is on measurements of human and environment behaviors and fecal contamination for assessing risk of cholera in urban Kenya. So in 2022-2023, Kenya as a country, we woke up to news almost every day, morning, evening, about cholera outbreak in different parts of the country. And this went on for quite a long time, actually for a whole year from 2022 to 2023. And just like the colleague in Malawi mentioned, and this was so impactful that it was actually captured even by one of your media houses in the US. And the person... Uh, in here, other than the journalist, is the is the is the head of our institution in Cambridge, who is also a cholera expert, and he was trying to explain the importance of um, having vaccination and putting in place measures to prevent these occurrences. So all these reports were coming from all over the country, and what that means is that cholera remains a great public uh, health impact in Kenya, not just in Kenya but also other countries within Sub-Saharan Africa. And most of the cases, of course, of cholera, just as it has been talked about today very, by many speakers, is that most of the cases are spread within the sub-Saharan Africa. And again, going back to the 2022-2023 outbreak, as much as most of the cases were coming from Malawi, as has been reported in the, by the previous speaker, and Ethiopia, Mozambique, and other countries, Kenya was not spared. And we had um, quite some significant uh, cases that were confirmed. And these are the ones that were confirmed through culture, about 12,000, and with CFR of 1.7, which is beyond the WHO uh, recommendation. So again, in cholera in Kenya, we've suffered quite a number of outbreaks. And the biggest outbreak was reported in 1997 to 1999, where more than 45,000 cases were reported and um, with a CFR of 4.3. So the most, that's our beautiful map of Kenya as a country, and in red is where most of those cases are normally reported. And these are mainly the border, ta border towns, bordering Somali, bordering Sudan, bordering Ethiopia, and also the, the Lake Saint regions, as well as the, the capital city, which is Nairobi. So then our main objective was basically to investigate the biblical hotspots and also assess the exposure to fecal contamination using E. coli as, a, as an indicator and also check for vibrio cholera among the environmental samples. And from all these then, with the evidence-based uh, information that we have, then we recommend tools for cholera prevention and also implement the integrated intervention strategies. So that is our, our study site. Our study site is based within one of the informal settlements in Nairobi. I know Nairobi is the home to one of the largest informal settlements in Africa, which is called Kibera. But then other than that one, there are other informal settlements which are also quite populated. And they have all the definitions of uh, an informal settlement, which includes the poor housing, the overcrowding because of the huge population, and also the huge, uh, the, the poor wash infrastructure. And all the photos that I'll show in this presentation are actually photos that we've taken as we're working within our, our study site. So these are some of the situation that within the informal settlement. So the standard approach, we used the sunny path tool that was developed by our colleagues in Emory. And I'm happy Andrew is here and he was over to speak in the morning. And it uses uh, three, uh, strategies or three approaches. 
One is through the transit walks, and this was to, to be able to engage the key um, stakeholders within the community so that we get to hear from them because there are various outbreaks that normally happen. So we wanted to hear from these people, where do these cases come from? So we're talking about, we were talking to the community elders, we're talking to the, the clinicians who see these patients, we're talking to the people in charge of these facilities, and we're also talking to also the pharmacy owners, because we realize that in Kenya, most of the people in the study are really, before they even go to the hospital, they'll actually show up in the nearest pharmacy so that they can get some antidiarrheal tablets. So, um, that was one of the approaches, and the other one was then to, to conduct the behavior survey you so that we can be able to know, uh, once we identify the pathways, how often do these people interact with these pathways so that they can be able to expose themselves to the cholera, uh, to the cholera itself. So we did the three surveys, and the surveys included um, the community, where we did surveys involving men and women, separately and then the school level as also as well as the household and the third one was the pathogen detection whereby we took samples from all these pathogens from all the pathways and also had to test for E. coli to be able to determine the exposure to the fecal contamination exposure as well as test for vibrio cholera itself. Yeah so from the key informants um uh, interviews that we did we were able to identify from the two main villages and within the administrative zones we were able to know at least where most of the cases are normally reported from and through that we were able to to randomize and be able to select the households that we'll be able to put in our study and in terms of the pathways we were able to get from the nine pathways which included the drinking water the drinking water was either it is supplied the informal settlement through by the municipal council, which means that they have common taps, as you're seeing there, or borehole or water vendors, who, who vendor using the cuts, or also the stone drinking water. So we sampled all that. The flood water, which is basically the water that remains when it rains. The surface water, which is supposed to be like the lakes and the rivers, then there's no lake in that place. So there are rivers that are supposed to be flowing across, uh, through the, through the the villages, but then you realize that that, that the river is no long, not a river anymore, but that is where people normally put in the waste and all that. And then the open drains, which are the drains that run uh, along all the houses, almost all the houses within the informal settlement. We have the street foods. I can see some Kenyans from here, so you can identify very well with the street foods that are there, Mandazi and Gizeri, and also the raw produce, which do not have to be cooked before they are eaten which include tomatoes, the shaved ice, which is the ice that is made from home and circulated for sale. We also sampled from soil and we swapped the public latrines. So in terms of the behavioral surveys, we were able to ask these people, you can see the school children, we did the girls separately, the boys separately. In the community, we did the men separately, the women separately, and also in the households. And so the question was, how often they expose themselves to the identified pathways. And we were able to do a total of 800 um, household surveys and also 16 community surveys and the school surveys. So this is again the interaction, how, how well these people inter interact with these pathways that were mentioned. You can see the children, they play very casually or very normally. I mean, within the, within the, the, uh, in the open drains, so after, all, after, after now getting the samples, we processed them. All the samples that we took either for food samples or water or the swabs from the toilet they were processed. And uh, we did the cultures for the E. coli identification and also for color identification. And we also went ahead to do the qPCR so that we can be able to, which is more, which is more uh, sensitive in terms of being able to identify the pathogens. So in terms of um, the frequency of contact with the environmental pathways, it was interesting to find that there are actually different results within the different villages, and these are the neighboring villages. So for example, we found that there was high proportion of individuals from one of the villages, which is highly populated, which were more often, they came into contact with flood water, open drains, and the drinking water, and also, uh, and and the, the raw produce. So for this one, we did um, analyze for each of the pathways and then the different villages and also 
the differences in children and also in the adults. So what we found out is that uh, in terms of fecal contamination using E. coli as a predictor, uh, predict, uh, to predict the, the level of um, E. coli, um, uh, fecal contamination, sorry, uh, a couple of, sorry, oops. I don't know what happened to my slides. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Yeah. So realize that in terms of the flood water and um, and open drains and also surface water, those ones had more than ninety five percent of the samples that we collected were contaminated with E. coli, and eighty percent for the shaved eyes, and all those indicate that the, all these could be possible sources of infection. So when you combine now the, the behavior surveys plus also the plus the behavior surveys coupled with uh, with the positivity or, or the exposure to fecal contamination, then you realize that you are able to identify the most dominant um, most dominant uh, pathways within different villages. And for one of the villages, um, in adults, for both villages, the raw produce played a key role in terms of transmission of cholera. And in the children, uh, in one of the villages, the raw produce was the main one and also the open green flood water. So what you realize is that is in this, in this village that is called this one, when during the COVID time, the government went in and tried to improve the wash facilities by improving the water and also by improving the, the open drain such that instead of having the open drains that I was showing in the earlier pictures, the government was able to put some concrete um, open drains. And you can see this one is, is, uh, is actually very well explained here. So that the village that did not have that kind of uh, intervention from the government is where we found uh, most of these uh, pathways playing a key role in intervention in our transmission so in terms of cholera positivity again uh, we did not uh, get any culture positives from for vivo for cholera however we did the pcr and uh, from the pcr we were able to detect cholera in 76% uh, of uh, uh, samples the flood water samples and the open drain and also 96% of the um, of the surface water samples so there are some pathways that we, we, we sampled all throughout the year so that we can go to tell whether there was a difference in terms of uh, our seasons and there are others that we did not. So for those that we sampled um, throughout the year, that was the street foods and the open drains. And you can see uh, some of the, some of the uh, pathways that we actually sampled, they were, they were, we were able to detect cholera in, in a... We were able to detect cholera in these samples all the times that they were sampled. And this includes, um, uh, this includes the surface water, the open drains, and also the flood water. And in terms of seasonality, what we realized is that uh, most of the, some of those pathways are, are actually higher, especially the drinking water, which is really relevant because people drink water continuously, like every time. So most of the drinking water was more contaminated during the, the wet months of October, November, and also in the month of March to May. So in terms of possible exposures to cholera and in adults and in children, the darker the color here, the, the darker the color here is uh, the more intense the, the, the cholera uh, concentration was. So based, based on this, we were able to identify the multiple pathways of exposure ex existing in this area. And adults were more exposed to vibrio cholera mainly through drinking water. And also the children were more exposed to cholera in this village through surface water. And all these were very uh, important pathways in terms of uh, cholera transmission. Then what did we do after that? So we went back to the community after we did the behavioral surveys, after we did the lab, 
we went back to the communities because we wanted to give them back this information on what is it, what came out from what we were doing. And what we did is that uh, based on, uh, on, on the pathways that we identified as the most important in different areas, we were able to design posters and we went back to the schools and we went back also to the community. We called back the same people that we had involved so that we can be able to explain to them exactly what pathways could be exposing them to cholera. And we also did a bit of uh, health education and wash awareness, both in schools and households. And as we're moving in the households, we realized that most of the kids, most of the people are taking water from open buckets where they just take the cups and scoop. And in the process, the contamination happens. So what we did was to, to try and improvise so that now instead of scooping, uh, drinking water from the buckets, we had to, we gave them some buckets that hand the taps where they just uh, fetch the water for drinking. We also engaged with other stakeholders um, so that we can be able to explain this using the Sunday Path tool to be able to, to assess the fecal contamination. And again, the Kenyan government, because of the outbreaks that were there, they brought in the um, some few doses of cholera uh, vaccines. And there are only 200,000 doses against the entire population. And um, our team came out so that we can be able to sensitize the people that in the communities where we are working so that they can be able to go out for vaccination. For vaccination. Unfortunately, this cholera, they were only given one dose. The second dose, nobody was able to get a second dose. In conclusion, um, so we report there are possible uh, multiple pathways of exposure to cholera in this area. And also there is need to investigate the role. Uh, people have talked about the role of the climate change and cholera. And also we wish we can be able to be able to do wa more work on the wastewater surveillance within these areas and other parts of the, of the country. And I can say that we are open for collaboration in this in case other people, people would want to be interested in partnering with us on how we can be able to really generate more data that can be used by you modelers to be able to predict when these, the other um, outbreaks are likely to come and also to be able to prevent them for the sake of the people. We also recommended OCV campaigns as a way of um, prevention, control, and also the wash infrastructure. And interestingly, after we did all this environmental sampling, then after two months, we got other reports of um, a cholera outbreak that happened, and we got the clinical samples from those ones. And just to mention that also our samples have gone through sequencing, and we are waiting now to analyze the sequencing results so that we can be able to see to understand better the genetic relatedness between the, 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 the environmental samples and also the clinical samples that have been reported in the country. So thank you very much. And I wish to thank um, the investigators, the community health providers who took us to their communities, the study team. Uh, this study was funded by Welcome Trust. And I thank uh, the symposium organizers and the Gates Foundation for giving us this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cecilia, for a wonderful talk. Do we have any questions from the audience? Thanks for the presentation. If I if I understood you correctly, I think you said that the you didn't have a lot of culture positive results, so that's why you went with the QPCR for the environmental surveillance. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about that and if you were also seeing those types of discrepancies in the clinical surveillance data. Thanks. Uh, so we did the PCR because as you know, dealing with the environmental samples, the water, because of the dilution and all that, the sensitivity of the cultures would be very low. So that is why we went ahead to do the QPCR so that we can, because this was an indication to show us where could there be possibilities of cholera in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the pathways that we were looking at. So that is why we did the QPCR. In terms of the clinical samples, the, the standard, um, the gold, uh, the, the, the very first uh, test that are normally done are the rapid tests at the hospital level, at the clinical level. And then now we get those samples and confirm them with culture. And in most, most of the times, 80% will turn positive. So we put them through PCR when we want to go ahead and do the genomics. Yeah. 
Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I was wondering about, I guess, similarly with the environmental exposure pathways and picking up all that cholera through qPCR, um, was there clinical data, like cases at the same time that you were seeing, like in the community, or was this sort of maybe evidence of, you know, exposure um, of silent transmission or exposure without cases? Yeah, uh, sporadically, we got a few cases once in a while, but uh, it wasn't like an outbreak during the time that we were doing the study, we were doing the environmental. But as I've said in my last uh, point was that actually we got the outbreak after this one. But we also collected those clinical samples and it was most of them are from the same area. So once we do the sequencing analysis, the sequence analysis, then we'll be able to tell whether there is some relatedness. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Cecilia. Um, might perhaps be a comment, uh, maybe on your presentation as well as uh, uh, Limani's earlier on. I don't know if it wasn't a problem in Kenya, uh, but I know it was a problem last year in, in Malawi, uh, Mozambique, uh, Tanzania, and Zambia, that there was cholera throughout the year. Yeah. Because obviously, I mean, this was kind of a deviation from the normal. Because the normal is associated with the rainfall, and therefore you got cholera cases. So my hypothesis that I'm putting forward, sorry, I'm not uh, from a bi biological background, uh, would be looking beyond the obvious, you know, uh, rain and sanitation, could be the other social determinants of uh, health that perhaps could be contributing, or perhaps could be a new vari variant of, uh, of cholera that's uh, out there. Uh, so maybe I uh, just wanted your comments on that. Thank you. Yeah, that is very true. That's very that's something that is very unusual that we all that's what I started with. That um 22, 2023, it went on and on until the ministry even stopped reporting about it. But in the labs we were getting the um, the I mean samples coming in in very big numbers. And it it could be because of the pathogen dynamism and, and but that's how I was saying that once we do the the sequencing for these samples because we got all the clinical samples that we got that time and we are doing we are doing the the sequence analysis then we'll be able to compare with what was there before we'll also be able to compare with what we have from the environment at almost the same time then we can be able to have a story to tell yeah okay Excellent. Well, if we don't have any other questions, um, let's thank Cecilia for her presentation.